here's a motivational applied problem that has a lot of links to a lot of stuff going on in calculus and I think it's pretty relevant today. Let's say you have programmed a self-driving car. Uh, if you're a computer science major or maybe an engineer, you might be doing something like that in the future. And you're out doing trials, driving around a residential neighborhood. Uh, this is the Ypsilanti bookmobile right here. And this is what the car sees out its front windshield. Everything going okay? Anything to think about? All right, well, let's look a fraction of a second later. Here's what the car sees. Anything going on there? What should the car do? And then another fraction of a second later, what does the car see? Oh, look, it's a five-year-old on a bike crossing the street. Maybe the car should slow down. But the question is, how much should the car slow down? You don't want to jam on the brakes if you don't need to, because that's going to disturb the occupants. So the car is going to have to calculate how much brake pressure it needs and uh, pretty, better do that pretty quickly. Um, so uh, like any good calculus class, I have the world's cheesiest animation of a car approaching a bike here. Uh, this is in the computer programming language Scratch. Uh, you don't have to learn Scratch for this class, but it sure is fun. So we've got the car velocity set to 11 meters per second. And let's uh, put it in motion here and see what happens. Hmm, well, we don't have any slowing down programmed here, and the car just ended up hitting the bike after 0.38 seconds, which does not seem like the best plan of action to me. So I've got another car programmed over here that has an acceleration value in it uh, set to negative 7 meters per second squared. Um, that turns out to be a pretty hard stop. It's not the actual maximum stopping power for most cars, but it's pretty close to it. And let's see what happens with that. Um, so here we go. This car will be red. Nope. Nope. Uh, was not stopping hard enough. So let's apply more stopping power. Instead of negative 7 meters per second squared, let's use negative 10. That's about the hardest stopping a, a passenger car can reasonably do. So let's run it again. Ooh, nope. Didn't do that. Uh, didn't do it. Uh, let's try negative 15 which is harder than a car can actually do. Ooh, just barely stopped before hitting the bike. But do we want to stop just before hitting the bike, or would we rather stop with like a meter left to spare just in case the bike swerves, or in case our biking, uh, our braking power isn't exactly what we think it is? So we want to be able to uh, do these calculations and automate these calculations, and that's where calculus comes in. So uh, I've got this set up in Excel, or at least the start of it. Um, we need to choose kind of a time origin and a position origin for the bike, uh, for the car and the bike. So let's say it's kind of since you left the most pre the most recent stop sign. So we're 60 meters past the most recent stop sign. The bike is 65 meters past the most recent stop sign. So we're five meters away. And it's been 13 seconds since we were at a dead stop. So our current position is 60, our current velocity is 11 meters per second, and we said initially let's try uh, 7 meters per second braking, uh, which is an accelerate of meters per second squared. Um, since we're slowing down, you could call that a deceleration or a negative acceleration. So how will we do our computations here? I want you to pause the video uh, when I tell you to and think about what formulas you could fill out here that will compute what's going on with the car every tenth of a second. So um, it's okay if you have no idea, um, but and it's okay if you have some idea, but I want you to pause and think about how you're going to fill that out in three, two, one, pause. Okay, welcome back from pause. Uh, let's take a look at what you might have noticed here. This thing that we'll call a prediction equation or an extreme zoom in equation, we'll see why later. It's saying to predict a change in a certain value, like position, uh, let's say we know the rate of change, uh, like change per unit time. Multiply that by how much time changed, and that tells you how much the value changed. And then you can apply that to say, well, if I know my current position, then the change, current plus the change in the current position gives me my new position. Um, so my new position here should be my current position plus the velocity times the change in time, which is one tenth of a second here. So it's usually a good idea to compute the change in time. 
So I clicked on that cell. I'm going to do a quick intro to Excel for people who haven't used it before. Uh, all this should work in Google Sheets fairly well too. Um, so I clicked on that cell. I hit equals because I want to start a formula. And then I click on this cell and then hit the minus key and click on this cell. And that will tell Excel to take this value, subtract that value, and show me the answer here. So I get a tenth of a second, so that's working okay. Uh, and then I want to do a similar thing as time goes on. I don't have to type a similar formula here. I could copy this. I'll show the slow way to copy it. I can hit copy, and I could click and scroll down, and then right-click and hit paste. And it did it copy this formula and paste it there? Well, sort of. I mean, my, this formula was A11 minus A10, but this formula is A, A12 minus A11, which is actually what we wanted it to do, right? We wanted it to compute the new change in time, not always use these two cells in particular, even when I was down here. So it updated the formula based on what I was really doing, which was saying, use the cell that's over and down one minus the cell that's immediately to my left. Another way of doing that instead of copying and pasting is to click on the cell you want just to highlight it like that and you see how this little box here this corner of the green outline is different than the other three corners. That is called the auto fill handle and I can click on that so usually my cursor is a fat plus. If I hover over the auto fill handle then it's a medium sized plus and I can click and drag and that basically does a copy paste. You can see it's pasted in that formula but updated for the new rows and I could have um, I just hit undo there. I could have dragged this down like that which would be fine. Now let's say I had like 10,000 rows here. I wouldn't want to go drag 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 drag. I'd probably overshoot and then have to come back there's a shortcut, I can just double click the fill handle here and it goes down as far as the column next to it. Uh, even if you have 10,000 rows, you can do it all at once. So I've computed my change in time from one row to the next. So that's going to be helpful because I keep using that delta T. Delta usually means the change in the Greek letter delta. Um, so the next big question is how do I compute my new position based on what I have here. So uh, maybe take a sec to pause the video and think about what you're going to fill in there. Okay, welcome back from pause. So I want to say my new position on this row is my previous position plus the velocity times the change in time from the previous row to this row. And that increased a little bit. I have these numbers highlighted in blue because they're just numbers typed in. There's no formulas there. But on this row, I'm going to be using formulas. So that's my new position based on my old position. And then what's my new velocity based on my old velocity? Well, I can use this prediction equation idea again to say the rate of change of velocity is the acceleration. So I can say equals my previous velocity plus my acceleration value times delta t. And then what's my new acceleration value? Well, this one actually isn't determined by math. This is determined by whether you want to presume constant acceleration or something fancy like you step on the brake pedal harder and harder in the first tenth of a second or fifth of a quarter of a second usually, maybe half a second. But for now, I'll just say let's use constant acceleration. So I'll say equals the cell above me to just copy that value here. And then I want to do this all, whole thing on the next row and the next row. So I can just click in the middle of the cell and, and highlight over and then double click to fill down. And that pastes in all these updated formulas. And that's what I want. Um, so anytime you've got a table of numbers, it's a good idea to graph them. The easiest way to graph this stuff, now it's going to be a little different in Excel versus Google Sheets, but I'll show it in Excel for now. I'm going to click in the upper left part of the block of stuff I want to highlight, including the words, not just the numbers. Click and drag all in one motion down to there, and then I'll go to Insert, uh, and I want to insert a scatter plot. 
and I usually don't want smooth connectors. I usually want uh, either plain dots or dots with con straight connectors or straight connectors with no dots. So here I want to see dots for each time step. And this graph needs some interpreting. It should also have some of the labels on it. So I'm going to go to add chart element, axis title, primary horizontal, and then click in the formula bar here, hit equals, and click on this label time. And so now the label on the x-axis is whatever is in this cell. And the label on the y-axis is complicated because I've got position velocity and acceleration all happening at the same on the same axis here. So it's kind of harder to label. Let's stop and think, does this graph make any sense? Well, the position is starting at 60 and progressing upward. The velocity is starting at 11 and progressing downward, so that's good. Uh, the acceleration seems to be constant, negative 7. Uh, that's good. Uh, delta t seems to be mostly constant, except why is it negative here? Oh, it's negative over here. Why is that negative? Well, if I double click on it to see the formula, it's using this row and the next row, but there's nothing in the next row. So it's just going to treat that as a zero usually, and that's what we're getting. We're getting zero minus 14, so we get minus 14. Uh, so that actually doesn't mean anything. It's using a blank cell. That's just junk. I'm just going to hit the delete key on that. Uh, better not have anything than have a number that doesn't make any sense. So that's showing us what's going on uh, with our car's position, velocity, and acceleration. Uh, so uh, can we tell from this, does the car hit the bike? So take a sec to pause and think. The car started at 60. The bike's initial position, or the bike's position is at 65. So how can you tell from this data table or this graph, does the car hit the bike? Pause in three, two, one, and unpause. Okay, so we'll track the bike, the, the car's position, and if it exceeds 65 while it still has some velocity, that means it's going to hit the bike at a velocity of whatever. Uh, we would hope that was zero or that it would never get to position 65, but apparently it gets past that and it's still going pretty fast, at least uh, from the bike's point of view. So this is not good news for the bike. It's going to hit the bike. Uh, we already tried in Scratch uh, putting acceleration of minus 10. It still goes past 65. We tried, uh, we tried minus 15 or minus 20. And there, it, at least, it uh, never quite gets to 65. In this case, it actually ends up going backwards, so we'd have to put in fancier Excel formulas for that, but we won't worry about that. All right, so this idea of using velocity to update position, using acceleration to update velocity, is a really, really important one in, in calculus, and there's all kinds of stuff we can do with it that we'll see throughout the semester, but this is just kind of a quick motivating example for now.